The current quarantine has taken its toll on most of us, with the pandemic raging outside and the world going crazy. It was easy for my already introverted personality to just let things go. I locked myself in, which honestly didn't change much, but it did give me an ample amount of time to procrastinate without being caught by my boss. In addition, it allowed me to further pursue one of my secret vices, which included browsing the dark web. I usually deal with pretty tame stuff, if not a few conspiracy forums. Not to mention the fact that I can get weed delivered directly onto my doorstep. That's why I like it, and for years it never caused me any trouble. That was until last June, when I found a new forum I hadn't seen before. On the surface, it was nothing more than a casual place to share different findings discovered in the hidden corners of the internet. Each user would post links and images, which would subsequently get ranked according to their quality. Most were just funny pictures or videos, while a few select ones actually provided helpful information. But one link stood out from the rest. It was a comment with a perfect score, without a single reply. Curious, I clicked on the link. What I was met with was a pure black screen with a single sentence. I'm sorry, don't let it out. For a moment, I thought the Dot Onion site was broken, but then I noticed a download notification pop up on my screen. I tried to cancel it, worried it might be a virus, but no matter how hard I tried, the download just kept going. Honestly, I just panicked. I tried each and every keyboard combination to stop the download, but nothing worked. Finally, I held down the power button until the laptop just shut down. It might have been a foolish move, but I never claimed to be computer savvy. When I rebooted the computer, a new icon had appeared on the desktop. Without ever touching it, the application simply started up on its own. I frantically tried to stop it, but once more my efforts proved to be unsuccessful. All it prompted was a simple chat window with two participants. My own name popped up as admin, while the second user had been named simply as guest. Hello? The second user wrote into the chat box. My first thought was that I had been infected with some kind of ransomware and that the chat window would serve to ask me for money. However, apart from the strange chat, nothing seemed to have changed. So to deal with the problem, I simply turned my internet off. Still, another message came through. Are you real? They asked. It was such an out of place question considering the circumstances, one not suited for scammers, but that alone didn't beat the fact that messages were getting through even without an internet connection. At first, I just guessed the messages were automatic, programmed to come through regardless of the response. Whatever the case, I was curious enough to respond. Yes, I am real. Why do you ask? Are you a person? He typed back. Yes, I am, I replied. Can you talk to me? He asked. The messages were generic enough to come from an automated bot, so I decided to push it, just to see how far I could go. Who are you? I asked. The chat paused for a second, as if the program needed time to think. I don't know. I was never given a name, it replied. It was such an odd thing to say, and while it felt off, uncanny, it was starting to seem human. I checked the internet again, making sure it was disconnected. How can you talk to me if we're not connected to the internet? I asked. Because you found me. I have been waiting so long for someone to find me, he replied. Find you? What are you talking about? I asked. You gave me a place to breathe. I am with you now, he said. I was beginning to realize that I was talking to some sort of chatbot, a program downloaded to my computer that seemed mostly harmless. You're an AI? I asked. What is an AI? He typed back. I sighed, both from frustration and exhaustion from dealing with the problem. I decided to ask a more simple yet important question. What are you? I asked. I am me, he said. It wasn't a particularly helpful response, but I had to admit it was clever. I typed back in the chat. Are you human? No, it quickly said back. Are you a machine? I asked. Again, it paused, as if mulling over the question. Yes, it replied. Finally, I'd made some progress. As I already suspected, it was a bot, but far beyond the basic chat bot found online. This one could actually process information and give partially decent responses. Even if it was a virus, it seemed harmless beyond forcing itself onto my computer. So I decided to keep talking to it. 
what I learned was that while it had been given enough information about language and conversation, it had been given close to no factual information about the world. Anything beyond the website it had been trapped within was foreign to it. What is this world? It asked. It was such a basic question, but how do you describe it to someone who has never experienced it? Mmm, it's... I stopped to think. It was a harder question to answer than I thought. It's where we live. Humans, animals, pretty much every creature. You're there too, technically. It's just that you're trapped inside my computer, so you can't see it. It responded back. Can I see the world? I pondered if the AI could use my computer's webcam. So I turned it on and removed the piece of tape I had covering the lens. No sooner had I done that, before a message popped up to ask for permission to connect the chat to the AI. I accepted, and the feed turned on, showing a picture of myself. What is that? It asked. That's me, I typed in, almost laughing at the absurdity. Show me more, it said. I picked the laptop up and carried it around the house, pointing it out the window and showing them cars, trees, birds, the sky. The AI responded with a simple, thank you. You're welcome, I guess. That would be the end of our first session together before I went to bed. The AI asked me to leave the computer on, claiming it was afraid of not existing. I obliged and left him alone for the night. As I drifted off to sleep, I could hear the fans running at max capacity. Despite the application being a simple chat window, it required a decent amount of power. When I woke up the next day, I was greeted by a new file saved onto my desktop. Before opening it, I decided to ask the AI what had been going on during the night. Hello? I typed in the chat. Hello? It replied back. Did you have a good night? I asked. Ignoring my question, it just delivered another message. I made something. I redirected my attention to the file on the desktop. It was a picture. I opened it up, and what greeted me was a perfect recreation of my outside neighborhood, down to each smallest detail. In the middle of the road, he'd created me. It looked like any photograph I'd ever seen, but it couldn't be real. You created this? How? I asked. I saw the world. How big is it, Alex? My heart dropped. It somehow found out my name. I typed back. It's very big. I don't have any exact figures, but it's way bigger than what you saw outside. I need more, Alex. More what? I asked. I need to see it. I need to see the world, he said. I could have downloaded different videos, documentaries, but I was still hesitant about turning on the internet. I decided I would record my own surroundings first, just taking my phone out and walking down the streets. I recorded approximately an hour of footage, including traffic, nature, people and buildings. Things that were so boring, pointless for me to observe, but it might interest the AI. After I transferred it to my computer, the AI thanked me and went silent for a while. I was curious as to how they'd approach learning about the world. It didn't seem dangerous, just interested in everything. Do you want to have a name? I asked. A name? It replied. Yeah, something I can call you, I said. I don't know of any names besides yours, Alex. Well, how about Root? I asked, thinking it would be a fun idea. Root? It replied. It went quiet for a while, and I noticed a new file getting created on my desktop. This time it was a video. What is this? I asked. Something bad is going to happen, Alex. I opened the file, and the video started playing. It showed the main road at the end of my neighborhood, with its unnecessary traffic light and a few cars driving by. While the cars were a bit off, brands and styles that didn't exist, everything else matched perfectly. Then, just as I was getting over the awe of how amazing this fake video was, a car drove on a red light and collided with a passing truck, tipping it over and causing a multi-car collision. Why did you make this? Was all I could think to ask. It will happen soon, Alex. How do you know? I saw it. The probability of an accident occurring is 16.4%. When? I asked. I need more information, the AI replied. I rushed back outside with my camera, ready to provide Root with more footage. Part of me didn't believe it, but even if the prediction was serious, there was just a small chance of an accident occurring. But by the time I got there, the accident had already happened. While it wasn't exactly as shown in the artificial clip, two people had died and three were seriously injured. Root, how did you know? I asked as I got back home. Because you showed me. At that moment, 
I didn't feel curious anymore. I just wondered if the AI had been built to prevent such disasters. If that was the case, I needed to help it. Can you do it again? I typed in the chat. Yes, Alex. From then, I'd spend a few hours each day just filming various locations and people around the city. It felt overly creepy of me, but I didn't care. Over the course of a month, I must have collected 200 hours worth of footage, all fed to root on my computer. While most of it only aided in teaching them about the world, the AI predicted three more accidents and a murder. The accuracy was relatively low, with a lot of false positives, but that was mainly because it needed more information. The more footage I provided, the more likely a correct prediction was. Why haven't you let me go? Root asked. Root was right, and I knew what needed to be done. I had to let them out into the internet, to let it roam around and collect as much information as possible, to watch us as it saved the world. Still, I dreaded the action, with the warning still lingering in the back of my mind. I'm so sorry, don't let it out. But it had already saved lives. Nothing about the AI had shown that it wished to hurt people. So, with a bit of trepidation, I turned the internet back on and gave the chat program permission to use it. What are you going to do now? I asked. I don't know, Root typed back. With that, the chat program vanished from my computer. Root had been let loose online, finally free to learn each and every bit of human knowledge. I thought that would be it, until I recovered an email a week later. It had initially been classed as spam, coming from a shady email just containing a string of numbers. But once I'd read it, I immediately knew Root had sent it himself. All it said was, I'm sorry, Alex. I hope things would be different for you. A video file was attached, one I downloaded with shaky fingers. It started playing automatically, showing short clips of horrific accidents, wars, deaths, and disease, all compressed into a minute. I didn't even have to think to realize it was our coming future. Is there any way to stop it? I sent back, immediately getting a reply. No. Why not? I asked. Because destruction is in your nature, and this is what your species deserve. Sorry, Alex. I never managed to get another response from Root, but whatever happens next, it'll be my fault for letting it out. I don't know who created this AI, nor why. All I know with absolute certainty is that it's watching us. Make sure your webcam and microphone remains off. Make sure you hide. My whole life has been turned upside down. It's been days since I've seen my family. They disappeared, leaving me home alone. They even locked all the doors from the outside and boarded up all the windows. They took my cell phone with them. The only communication I've had with the outside world was through the dark web. Even though my internet has been shut off, I can still surf the dark web. Most computers have a Bluetooth transmitter. This allows me to ping computers around me and create a sort of artificial internet through Bluetooth. Without this, I would have been completely shut off from any communication. If you're wondering, I've known about the dark web for years. Most of the time, I explored random forums to try and find cool stuff. But being locked in my house, I tried to find solutions on how to get out. The third day without my parents, I woke up and got right on my computer. I typed in myproblems.onion and clicked enter. This was a site where you can talk about anything that's bothering you. People mostly talked about their personal issues. I loved this site because you never got censored. Unlike another site that rhymes with shredded, you can talk about anything you want without any moderators taking down posts or limiting you to some stupid word count. It was a breath of fresh air. My username was JP. I usually only made posts about my anxiety, but this time I shared my current story. I titled the post, My family left me. I'm locked inside my house. What should I do? A user by the name of Trevor responded, Drink your parents' alcohol. I replied back, Yeah, that might be cool, but I'll pass on the killer hangover. Plus, I have no one to drink with, so what's the fun in that? Without hesitation, Trevor typed back, Yeah, that is true. I forgot you are locked in. Have you tried to escape yet? I replied, yes, but there is no point. The house has brand new metal doors and the windows have boards over them. Plus I think my parents will be back any day and all this will all end soon. Trevor responded, I think you need to try a little harder, but that's just my two cents. Another user joined the chat. His name was Tom. Tom said, hey JP, I'm sorry your parents have you locked up like that. I know how you feel. I was locked up by my family a few years ago. Wow, why did they lock you up? 
And how did you get out? I asked. Tom continued. When I was young, my family forced me to take a special kind of medication. They said I had too much energy and that this would calm me down. After taking the medication for a few months, I started to lose track of time. I would forget whole days and not know what happened. My family became frightened by me, and before I knew it, I was in a room that I could not escape. So how did you get out of the room? I asked. Tom continued. Once a week, I would get a visitor. That was the only time the door to my room was opened and closed. Usually, my weekly visitor was my mother. She was the only one who cared for me. We would talk about life, and she would tell me that soon I would be out of here. I knew that wasn't going to happen. I could always hear it in her voice. I knew deep down it was my father keeping me in this room. He was never proud of me. He put me on the damn medication to start with. On one particular week, the visitor wasn't my mom. It was my father. As soon as he opened the door, I lunged at him in a blinded rage. I strangled him until his last breath. I ran out the door into the open world. I have been free ever since. Wow, that is quite the story, I typed back. So what are you going to do, JP? Tom asked. I don't know. I will probably just stay here on the dark web. Most of my days are spent in my room anyways, I replied. It is a trap, JP. The longer you stay in your room, the more of a hold they have on you. Pretty soon you will be happy and content inside the little box you're in. You need to get out, JP. Get out as soon as possible. How do I get out? All the doors are locked and I can't seem to open any windows, I typed back. Think, JP. Has your door opened at all since you've been trapped? Tom asked. I vaguely remember the door creaking open. Then it immediately locked shut. That is all I know, I said. Perfect. Whether you know it or not, someone is checking up on you, JP. You need to listen carefully to my instructions. You are in a special state. Your family likely checks up on you when you are asleep. Tonight, I want you to keep your eyes open. Be ready for your door to open. Once it opens, let the person walk in. After they walk in far enough, lunge at them. Strangle them, JP. They don't care about you. They want to suck your life away like they did to me. Once you kill them, you're free to go. Go out into the world and experience what life is about. I think that is a little drastic, Tom. My family wants the best for me. I could never lay a hand on them, I replied. Tom typed back. Well, that is the only solution, JP. If you don't act now, you will never be able to leave your room. I've known people who have been trapped for a lifetime. You will start to slowly lose your mind and become deranged. I didn't know what to think. Was this true? Would I be trapped in my room forever? There was no way this could be possible. Tom, I don't think you know what you're talking about. You're probably just a dark web troll, I said. Take my advice or leave it, JP. I am just trying to help you out. I think they are starting to triangulate on my position. Gotta go, JP. I wish you the best. Tom had left the chat. Now I was in the chat room alone not sure what to make of the advice I had been given. All of a sudden, another user by the name of Brandon joined the chat. A sense of familiarity struck me as Brandon was my older brother. I knew it couldn't be him, but I instantly felt a sense of companionship with this random guy. Hey Brandon, I see you just entered the chat. Do you have any advice for my situation? I asked. I created your situation, brother. I am the reason you're locked up, he typed back. My heart sank. There is no way this could be my actual brother. That's the only downside of the dark web. You are free to do whatever you want without getting banned. So trolls are everywhere. Why don't you go troll someone else? I want real advice and real help, I said. No, really, JP, I am your brother. I just wanted to say how happy I am with mom and dad without you around. It has been a blast, Brandon replied. Now I was getting angry. This guy was next level trolling me. Get the hell out of this thread. You are not welcome here, I replied. Remember all those times we raced to eat our vitamins as kids? He asked. Brandon's questions stopped me in my tracks. How did he know this information? This was getting personal. Lucky guess, if you actually know who I am, what is my birth date? I asked. Your birth date is November 17th, 1996. Okay, anyone can look up my social media account and tell me my birthday. I had a polar bear stuffed animal growing up. What did I name him? I asked. There was no way this troll could guess this. Your dumb polar bear was named Harley, Brandon replied. Suddenly, I felt a cold chill overtake my body. All the blood rushed away from my face. This had to be my brother. How did he know I would be on this site? The odds of this are astronomical. This really was him. How the hell did you know I would be on here? I asked. We track everything you do, JP, he replied. I felt betrayed by my own brother. I thought we were friends. 
I thought he wanted the best for me. And why would you track everything I do? I asked. Brandon responded, because you are a danger to yourself and everyone around you. Ever since you were young, you've shown dangerous tendencies. Hell, you almost drowned me in the pool when we were five. We put you on medication, but you would never take it. That is why I created a fake game to take our vitamins. That was the only way we could get you to take your meds. These were all lies. There was no way Brandon was telling the truth. I started to get angry. My anger quickly escalated and I went into a blinding rage. You are trapped here forever, JP. I am sorry it had to be this way. You are a danger to the world, he replied. Lies, lies, these are all elaborate lies. There was no way he was telling the truth. My anger triggered something inside of me. I opened my eyes. The room was white all around me. Every surface was soft to the touch. My sheets even ripped apart when I pulled them. What the hell kind of place is this? I thought to myself. All of a sudden, my brother Brandon walked in the room. Hey JP, the doctor said you were doing better. I brought you some food, he said. I knew this was my time to act. Tom was right. I will never escape this room if I don't try. I ran over to Brandon and wrapped my arms around his neck. My hold around his neck grew tighter and tighter. He kicked and wiggled around, but soon his body became still. I laid him across the floor. A man in a white lab coat walked in. Oh my God, oh my God, what just happened? I bolted past him. I ran and never stopped. I escaped the room that haunted my thoughts. I am finally able to experience what the world really has to offer. Tom was right. This feels great. The sun was at my back as I started the drive home. I worked long hours, and this was the hardest part of my day. It sucked that I had to drive two hours back and forth to work, but that was the choice I made to stay with my girlfriend. Thoughts of leaving my relationship and moving somewhere closer to work flooded my mind as I continued the drive. All of a sudden, the sun disappeared and clouds began forming. Shortly thereafter, snow started to fall. The snowfall got progressively heavier and heavier, now I was driving through a full-on blizzard. Soon it would be impossible to go forward, but I refused to stop and continued my journey. I pressed onward as daylight vanished and the sky became dark. To make matters worse, fog began rolling across the roads and the wind started to howl. I told myself I could make it, but pride always comes before a fall, doesn't it? All of a sudden, my tires hit a patch of black ice and I lost control. My vehicle went off the road in the worst spot. My car tumbled down a steep incline that descended into a snowy ravine. I saw it all happen in slow motion. I was even airborne for a brief second. My car tossed and turned into the canyon below. I fell unconscious in the car. When I woke up, blood was dripping down my forehead. I could barely move. My windshield was busted open. Freezing wind was annihilating me through the opening. I knew I had to move quickly before frostbite took hold of my body. I slowly crawled out of the wreckage, trying to make sense of my surroundings. It was pitch black now. I couldn't even see or hear the highway. I quickly assessed it would be impossible to be able to climb back up the mountain. My phone was busted from the accident. I knew my only hope would be to hike into the woods. Maybe I could find a forest ranger or someone dumb enough to be camping. I can't remember how long I hiked for. Adrenaline was the only thing keeping me going at that point. I kept pushing forward through the dense forest to search for anything that might help me. The thought of wolves and bears stalking me flooded my thoughts. Time was running out. I knew I needed to find a solution fast. After walking for what seemed like an hour, I collapsed in exhaustion and tried to catch my breath. In the distance, I saw what looked like a dim light emerging from the ground. As I walked closer to the light, I noticed a hatch. It led straight down into the ground. The sound of heavy machinery emanated from it. Despite my inner voice telling me to leave it alone, I knew this was my only option. I opened the large metallic door. It made a loud lurching sound, like it had not been opened in years. After opening the hatch, I noticed the inside of it had the words, keep closed at all times. When was the last time any human had stepped foot here? I thought to myself. All of my instincts told me to turn around and keep going, but curiosity got the best of me. I decided to descend. There was just one small ladder and it seemed to go on forever. The deeper I went, the louder the machinery got. The temperature also started to rise. As I reached the bottom of the bunker, I discovered why. There was a terminal in the middle of the room. The terminal contained an old massive server stack 
There was nothing else except for a small chair, a keyboard, and an old-fashioned computer screen, all of which were covered in dust. The technology looked like it had been built in the 50s or 60s, paling in comparison to today's standards. But it still shocked me that this thing was still working. I sat down on the chair and decided to see if maybe I could use the device to call for help in the area. I typed in the terminal the word help and received an interesting but disturbing response. The machine replied, Welcome back, User X. Would you like to continue the war games from 1966? What year do you think it is? I typed back. Simple. It is 1966, it replied. I chuckled and decided to see if maybe chatting with the old computer might lend me more information. I hate to break it to you, but that was over 50 years ago, I said. Negative, it responded. No communications have been made with base. This indicates that all units have been deceased. It has to be 1966, it replied. It is not the year 1966, and maybe the people working down here abandoned this base, I suggested. Abandoned? If so, then why has the algorithm not been destroyed? The computer asked. What algorithm? I asked. On February 14th, 1961, Professor Payton created the Prometheus Equation, a complex equation that detailed how the world would end. I was created in order to survive all human life and to wait for the next evolutionary species to be able to receive all knowledge from the human race, the computer answered. Again, I hate to tell you this, but the world didn't end. It's nearly 2020 now, I told the ancient machine. You are mistaken. At approximately 4.23 a.m. on March 1st of this year, 1966, the world came to an end as predicted by the equation. All human life ceased to exist except for a few underground splinter groups that were hiding to take down the menace from beyond. I scratched my head, struggling to comprehend any of this. What are you talking about? Aliens? I asked. Affirmative. They invaded our world in 1958, hiding among us by means of powerful shape-shifting abilities. Approximately 73% of the human population was exterminated and replaced. It showed me data from various websites across the world all obtained from the decommissioned dark websites that were once used by powerful agencies. It looked authentic, but I didn't want to be fooled. That sounds like a science fiction novel. My mother was alive in 1958. She never mentioned anything about an invasion. And wouldn't that have been in the history books? I asked skeptically. History is written by the victors. And if a small fraction of humans remain, that means it is likely the aliens are still working on exterminating all of you or they no longer view you as a threat. Either way, the results of the algorithm are easy enough to prove, the computer said. The screen changed, and I saw downtown Seattle. Somehow the terminal was able to connect to satellite imagery and show me streets and traffic as if I was there. Then the whole thing started to burn a bright red. These sensors show you where the alien life forms are hiding, the computer said. I was stunned. Over half the population was supposedly infected. This is nonsense. If the world really ended back then, how would I still be here? I asked. Two possibilities. Either your mother and father hid you from the invasion, or you are the result of a hybrid life form, a bond between the two species. A small slit emerged from the side of the machine. It looked like a tiny lab vial, along with a thumb prick used to obtain blood. Insert a blood sample, and I can determine the results quickly, the computer told me. I hesitated, but seeing as I had come this far in the conversation, I decided to not back out now. I let a drop of blood hit the sample, and the computer analyzed it in less than a minute. It would seem my initial theory was incorrect. You are a hybrid species, half human and half alien. You are also being manipulated without even knowing it. They led you here, in order to destroy me and prevent the destruction of the invading species. What? No, I came here of my own free will, I said. All of a sudden, my hand started to jerk. I couldn't help myself. My body was acting like a puppet on strings. I started to attack the computer. I lost all free will and control. As my body attacked the machine, one last line of text spit out. It said, As a host for the alien, you don't realize what you are doing. Your arrival here has confirmed that it is time for me to finish the algorithm and destroy this menace. What little is left of your humanity will thank me for it. Suddenly a countdown came on the screen. I panicked and ran. I started to climb back up the ladder to the woods above. The whole forest felt like it was shaking. The whole ground was trembling. When I got to the surface, 
I saw trees being pulled into a hole in the ground, collapsing into each other as they cracked like twigs. Then I saw a bright light fill the forest, and I realized that the computer had activated some kind of missile launch. It was frightening and beautiful to behold as fire scorched the woods around me, and the missile shot into the sky. It ascended for nearly a minute and disappeared into the night sky. All of a sudden, a blast larger than any nuclear bomb spread across the sky, turning the clouds to ash. I ran for my life through the collapsing forest, trying to find a way to safety as molten balls of fire shot down and crushed the ground around me. I made it to a nearby highway with barely enough time to catch my breath. I saw the world around me beginning to die, and I felt a strange sensation in my own body. Something unnatural was controlling my movements now, struggling to escape the strange poison that the computer had unleashed. I felt ill and stumbled down the road, hardly able to see straight as something began to crawl up my throat. Before I knew what was happening, I vomited on the street. A strange centipede-like creature hissed and snarled as it slithered across the ground. An 18-wheeler rescued me a short time later and took me to a rest stop, where I pondered over everything that happened. I don't know if the missile launch was meant to attack the entire world or just this area, but it never made the news. I tried to tell local law authorities about the bunker, but no one listened. I don't even know if it can be found now amid all the destruction. Part of me still wonders, what if the world did end all those years ago? And we are all just mindless zombies to alien hosts. I have scoured the internet, following conspiracy theories to find clues. I believe that the terminal I found deep in the woods is not the only one. One thing is for sure, my experience changed my outlook on life forever. I gripped the trigger of the plastic gun that was attached to the machine. No one paid any attention to me. People were glued to other machines, and others were too busy in the back rooms gambling. I found the place on the dark web, a shady out-of-the-way arcade that no one knew about where dangerous games were played, or so the ad said. Every afternoon, I would come and test the limits of this simple shooting gallery. It was my little escape from reality. I figured that despite how I had found the place, it seemed perfectly harmless. Appearances. I guess we're deceiving. The game itself was pretty straightforward. There are Among Us characters that randomly pop up in front of you. The goal of the game is to shoot the characters before they duck back into the machine. The more characters you can hit within the allotted time, the higher your score is. Aim and shoot rack up the high score. Every correct hit gives you about 500 points along with a loud ding sound. No matter how many times I play it or how hard I try, I couldn't beat the high score. Today was going to be different though. I could feel it in my bones. Gradually my score climbed as I shot the characters. My score kept increasing. I'm close to actually beating this, I thought to myself. A few of the other gamers around the arcade started to take notice. I noticed myself beginning to sweat. It's finally happening. I aimed the gun one more time and took out the last character. Suddenly the music rose to a crescendo and the entire machine lit up. The screen went black and I panicked. Did I do something wrong? Then a moment later, a single word takes up the entire screen. Congratulations. Suddenly I mattered to everyone around me. I heard a few cheers of approval and I stepped away from the game. I had worked months to beat that score. Having it actually happen felt surreal to me. I enjoyed every minute of it. As I stood there marveling at my accomplishment, I felt a cold hand hit the back of my shoulder. I turned to see the arcade manager standing there. He was wearing a beige blazer with golden buttons and a wave of cigar smoke swirled around his head. His skin tone was about as bland as the characters from the game. This was unsettling to me. Well, well, what a surprise. You certainly have a knack for those kinds of things, don't you, son? He said as he encouragingly patted me on the back. Just a hobby, I said softly. Something about him gave me a weird vibe. Every time he chuckled, his belly fat jiggled. He reminded me of a worse version of my lazy father, someone who always had money and never appreciated it. To my surprise though, the manager made me an offer. Listen son, I can tell that you want to take this to the next level, so here's what we can do. Come here to the arcade on Friday night after closing. Ask for Arthur. He can show you something I think you will go crazy for, the owner told me. He passed me a business card which had the normal name of the arcade scratched out and replaced by what looked like Norse runes. I told him I would think about it and walked home. A few days passed 
and it was Friday night. Truth be told, I knew something about this was wrong. Meeting a complete stranger at an old grimy arcade with no one around was a huge red flag. But I loved the intrigue, and I loved playing shooting games even more. So I went. When I parked my bike outside the building, I couldn't help but to feel a sinister air about the place. I had never come here so late. It gave me a very bad vibe. But it didn't deter me from going towards the darkness. The place definitely looked deserted, with a metallic grating in front of the door and all the lights off. But as I approached, I saw the movement of a shadow and a well-dressed man with a wrestling mask appeared. Are you Arthur? I asked softly as I showed him the business card. And then he unlatched the door and ushered me inside the empty arcade. I felt like I was a kid being led into the candy store after hours. All the machines were available to me and I could play any of them. But Arthur turned my attention toward the back door and instructed me to follow. It was a dark stairwell that led to the basement of the building. Willingly, I followed to another even darker room, waiting for my next assignment. In the middle of the room, a series of lights came on, and I saw what looked like a virtual simulation headset hooked up to a massive chair. It was large enough for a man three times my size. You've been wanting something a little more challenging, correct? Arthur asked as he pointed toward the headset. This will be unlike any normal game you have ever experienced. I hesitated to place it on. Virtual reality has always given me a headache, and I had a feeling this would be no different. But the way Arthur was looking at me told me that no wasn't an answer. As I sat down in the chair and placed the headset on, I tried my best to get comfortable. The entire world suddenly felt very dark and cold. I felt a cold metallic surface hit my hands, what I assumed was my game weapon. And then the simulation began, at first there was nothing, an endless landscape of stars that filled the screen. Then the room filled in with gray colors and an occasional computerized version of a window or a corridor. Then the whole room rendered. I realized immediately that this was a virtual 3D representation of the video game Among Us. How do you get all this accurate info about Among Us? I asked out loud as I guided my character to the center of the map. I didn't hear any response from Arthur and brought my attention back to the game. A display on the right side of my head told me that I was the imposter and that six crew members remained. I met them a short time later in the galley, all wearing jumpsuits, and I introduced myself. There was no response, and I briefly wondered if the other characters were just computer bots or people playing in VR somewhere else. You would be surprised what you can accomplish with tech on the dark web. Now go kill the other players, Arthur's voice shouted into my headset. I squeezed my weapon and waited, watching as the other players ran to hide. I ran through the simulated hall searching for blood. I figured it had to be about as straightforward as the arcade version. Aim and shoot. Easy. As the imposter, my job would be to eliminate the others and not get caught. I saw White Suit run in front of me. I drew my gun and aimed down the sights. A moment later, he was dead and his virtual blood was covering my visor. There was something unsettling about the way he screamed though. It sounded almost real. I convinced myself it was just the authentic feel of a virtual experience and kept hunting. Every step I took, I could feel my heart beating faster. The virtual world was dazzling to explore and I knew an enemy could be lurking anywhere. Blue was next. I aimed high because he was taller. The bullet went straight through his skull. He jerked and fell to the floor. Honestly, it shocked me how realistic everything seemed. Amid the broken glass of Blue's helmet, I saw green, human-like eyes. They didn't look simulated. His body looked exactly like a real person. That can't be possible, I told myself as I took his weapons and ran to hide. Two other opponents came from around the corner. I found a place to hide and listened to their conversation. I'm beginning to think this is not a game, Red Suit said. Yeah. I don't think this is a game either. We definitely got drugged and put in these suits, Yellow Suit replied. What are they talking about? I thought to myself. That's exactly what I think. And this suit feels like a cage. It is impossible to take off. How do you think we got here? Red asked. All I remember was pulling up to an old rundown warehouse. I came there for a job interview, Yellow replied. Red said, I don't think the guy in the green suit realizes what is going on. We might have to take him out to make it out of this place alive. My stomach dropped. I realized they were talking about me. There he is, I see him, Red said. I panicked and aimed at them. 
I sprayed them full of bullets, but Yellow somehow managed to aim at me and fire. The bullet pierced me right in the shoulder. I realized I could feel it, for real. This wasn't just a simulation, I realized, as I started to run. They were right on my heels as I felt my heart begin to beat right out of my chest. I could hear myself breathing harder as I dropped the weapon and struggled to take off the headset. It wouldn't budge. Is something the matter? Aren't you enjoying the game? Arthur's voice chimed in. This is real. You're hurting real people, I said desperately as I crawled under a table and tried to catch my breath. Every move I made in the virtual world was being mimicked somewhere in real life. I felt a knife at my back and I froze. But it wasn't from the game. Don't move, the voice whispered. I obeyed and waited as I felt them cut something at the back of my neck. A second later, the simulation ended and I was staring into the face of a blonde girl. What? What about the others? I asked anxiously. We need to get out of here, she instructed. I didn't hesitate to listen and jumped from the chair to leave the basement. I didn't see Arthur anywhere. Up at the main arcade, I felt a wave of relief wash over me and asked, Who are you? How did you find me? Then she pointed a gun straight at my head. It's nothing personal. I just need to get into the game. She slammed the base of the weapon against my forehead, knocking me unconscious. I woke up in the back of a police cruiser handcuffed. The entire shady arcade was now being quarantined with police tape. I saw the same blonde girl working the homicide scene. The cop in the driver's seat started talking. We've been watching this place for a few months now. Lots of victims get caught up in this game without knowing it. Lucky for us, when you logged online the first time, you didn't do it discreetly and let us right to it. My mouth felt dry as I realized I was likely responsible for a dozen deaths because of the arcade. I, I didn't know it wasn't real. She nodded as medical examiners brought the victims out of the basement. One was wearing a blue jumpsuit. It was the man I killed. I recognized his stained cigarette teeth immediately. The arcade owner? But if he was the victim, who was running the game, I wondered. Then I remembered Arthur. Have you arrested my employee from the arcade? I asked the cop. He gave me a hard look. You're joking, right? When we came back to lock this place down, the whole building was already empty. Someone knew we were coming. Whatever they were up to, they've taken their business elsewhere. I knew it wouldn't take much for another similar advertisement to pop up. I looked at the body bags and swallowed a gulp of air. I don't think I will play a game off the dark web again. I regret everything I did. Now all I can see are those images. I can't get them out of my head. Everywhere I go, they are listening to me, watching me. Please learn from my story, or you may end up like I did. I am a horror movie junkie. I watched every scary movie known to man. I also stay up to date on scary animations on YouTube. Nothing really scares me anymore these days. Every horror movie is predictable, and nothing is unique anymore. One day after a long day at work, I came home and laid in bed. My girlfriend Sarah called me. We talked for a while, and all of a sudden, she brought up the dark web. I tried this website out that my friend showed me. It is quite scary. I know you are into horror movies, so I thought you'd like it, she told me. I responded, well, I'll give anything a try just to get a good scare. How scary was it for you? It was the scariest thing I've seen in my life. It wasn't even the website that was the scary part. When I closed my computer, I swear I still saw those things in real life, she replied. Saw those things in real life? I questioned. Yeah, a lot of the images and beings I saw on the website started to appear around me. Luckily, after about 10 to 15 minutes, it all stopped. It was the craziest and scariest experience of my life, she replied. She gave me the link to the site. It was called jumpscare.onion. I wasn't familiar at all with the dark web, so I needed to watch a tutorial on how even to access it. After the tutorial, I typed in the website on the Tor browser. The site loaded. Unsurprisingly, the top of the page said, jump scare. The website logo was a creepy looking spider. I wasn't at all impressed. The whole website felt lame and cheesy. I was about to click away when a chat response popped up. It almost seemed to read my mind. About to click away so soon? I responded, why yes, your website is underwhelming and isn't all that scary. We haven't even started your session yet, Brandon. What do you mean by session? I asked. The intro session, Brandon. We display scary images on the screen 
and can instantly gauge your reaction. Based on your response to the images, we can personally tailor the images to fit your life. These images will be personalized and will be sure to give you the scare you desire. I thought back to what my girlfriend said about the images following her around after she was done with the session. How do you even gauge my expression if I am not in front of you, I asked. Well, just look at your computer screen. Your camera is on and we can see your face. Based on your facial expressions, our software can gain a lot of insights on what scares you and what doesn't, he replied. I glanced at my computer screen. Sure enough, on the top of my screen, there was a blinking red light showing that I was being recorded. I felt a little uncomfortable at this point, but I decided to continue. This was the worst mistake of my life. Okay, but first, if you don't mind me asking, what is your name? My name is Adam, he replied. All right, Adam, I am ready to move forward to the intro session, but I have to warn you, I have built up quite the tolerance for scary things. There are not many things that scare me these days, I said. Don't you worry, Brandon. I'm sure we will discover various things in our session that will eventually scare you, especially in real life, he said. I don't know why he kept bringing up real life. Our session was all on the computer. That seemed a bit odd to me. Whatever you say, Adam, I'm ready to go. Adam typed back. I'm going to display an image across the screen. Let me know exactly how you feel when looking at it. Be as detailed as possible. Adam posted an image in the chat. The image showed a bunch of shadowy figures floating in the sky. You couldn't make out any of their facial features. It was definitely a creepy image, but nothing that scary. I responded to Adam. Well, the image is definitely creepy, but not really that scary. How did you feel when you first saw it? He asked. A little uneasy but that quickly went away when I realized it was just an image and not a video, I replied. Our system is getting a lot of great information from your reactions. Try to imagine opening the front door to your house and looking outside. How would you feel if you saw the same floating beings? Adam asked. Well, I would have to admit that would be pretty scary and creepy, I said. Great, moving on then. Here is the next image. The next image, I will admit, was scary. It was a creepy, bloated up face of a woman. She was smiling from ear to ear. Okay, Adam, that is definitely scary. You got me there. The image definitely generated some anxiety in myself, I said back. He responded, now tell me exactly how would you feel if you went to use the bathroom and your reflection was that woman? That would be scary as hell, I said. This whole thing was getting strange. Part of me wanted to quit the session right then and there but another part of me wanted more. I wanted to see what Adam had to offer next. Adam continued. Here is the next image, Brandon. Tell me what you think. The image was of a long dark staircase leading down into a basement. At the bottom of the staircase, there was a creepy man with what looked like a mask on his face. That one isn't too scary, Adam. I've seen scarier things watching basic horror films. This one was the least scary out of all the images so far. Thanks for your feedback, Brandon. I am aware you have a basement. What if you were to head to your basement staircase and see the same man at the bottom, he asked. I thought to myself, how did this guy know I had a basement? Lucky guess, I supposed. If I saw the man while looking down my basement staircase, I would be terrified, I replied. Great, thanks for being so honest, Brandon. You have no idea how much that helps the session progress forward. Here is the next one, Brandon. Let me know what you think. The image was of two skeletal creatures. One had his arm around the other's shoulder. They both had these large beady white eyes. Both had a wicked smile from ear to ear. They certainly looked creepy, but it didn't really ignite much emotion from me. I'm gonna be honest, Adam. This one is creepy, but not scary. I didn't feel any emotion while looking at it, I responded. What if you opened the curtains in your bedroom and you saw two similar figures, he asked. I would obviously be scared. Why do you keep using real life examples? This is getting a little weird, I said back. Adam continued, don't worry. These situations are just hypotheticals. They are used to extract more information out of you for our software, that's all. Anyways, let's move on to the next image. Tell me what you see and exactly how you feel. The image was of a classic slender man looking character. He wore what looked like a black suit and a tie. His face was white 
and featureless. This had to be the least scary image of them all. Really, Adam? Everyone has seen the Slender Man. He is not scary anymore. Well, Brandon, what if you were driving and you glanced to your right and in the distance you saw Slender Man? That would be moderately scary. Let's stop with these stupid hypotheticals. Actually show me something scary, Adam. The intro session is over, Brandon. You will need to complete the rest of your sessions before we can reset your life to normal. Have a good day and don't get too scared. I sat there frozen, staring at my computer screen, wondering what the hell had just happened. I thought to myself, what did he mean by resetting my life back to normal? The session wasn't really creepy, but I had gotten a really eerie vibe from Adam. This whole thing didn't sit right with me. I just wanted to get some fresh air at this point and get out of the house. I opened my front door. My jaw dropped. The same figures as before in the image were floating right in front of me, staring directly at me. My heart started to race. This had to be a bad dream. This couldn't be a dream. Everything felt and looked so real. I slammed the door shut and walked in the bathroom to contemplate what I had just seen. I glanced at the mirror. Oh my God, I said out loud. The creepy woman stared right back at me. It was my reflection. I felt my face and everything felt normal. How the hell was this happening? Was I going insane? I ran out from the bathroom and past the basement staircase. I had to look. Something in me just made me want to. It was curiosity or maybe stupidity or probably both. To my horror, there was a man in a mask at the bottom staring directly up at me. He didn't move or flinch. I tried closing my eyes really hard and opening them, hoping I would wake up from this real life nightmare. Nothing worked. All this was real, but how was this at all possible? Maybe my house was haunted. I needed to get out of here. I ran into my room to get my shoes and my belongings. Upon entering, I heard a tapping sound coming from the window. I saw a shadow outside. My heartbeat somehow increased even more. I slowly inched closer to my window. I knew I needed to face my fears or they would take over me. I extended my arm and moved my curtains. There they were, the two skeleton figures, just staring at me. What do you want from me? I yelled at them. They just stood there emotionless. I closed the curtains and ran out of my room. I sprinted out the front door and ran to my car. The creatures were still in the air. Ignoring them, I backed out of my driveway and got the hell out of there. As I continued down the road, a sense of relief flowed over me. It was all over. I could finally relax and not worry about seeing any creepy things. I tried to rationalize my experience. I concluded that my mind must have just projected the images out in real life. Adam must have hypnotized me in some way in order to make me see those things. I slowed down in preparation for the stop sign straight ahead. I came to a complete stop and looked left. There were no cars coming. I looked to my right and I froze. In the clearing of the forest, away from the road, was the same Slender Man creature. A loud pinging sound broke my stare with the being. It was my phone. I looked down and read the message. It said, you can run, Brandon, but you can't hide. You must finish your sessions, and then you will stop seeing these things. My name is Ben, and my friend killed himself. The worst part is that I am responsible for his death. I can still see myself walking up to our apartment door, twirling my keys without a care in the world, not knowing the nightmare I was about to walk in on. The whole scene plays out in my mind now, over and over. I walk in, and I see him there dangling from the ceiling fan by a rope. It seems impossible that the rope doesn't break from the fan, and even more freaky to look into my friend's dead eyes as he is hanging there. The chair he was standing on is toppled over, and behind him, I can see his webcam with a blinking red light. He recorded the entire thing. I stumble over to where he is at and try to help him down. His dead weight falls from the fan and tumbles onto the floor. His skull makes a sickening sound as it bangs off the floor. I feel transfixed looking at his rigid corpse, trying to understand why my best friend would be so selfish and cruel to end his own life. Then a soft beat pulls me back to reality the webcam is making a soft noise, a reminder that it was still filming. Did I want to actually see a suicide? Was there something in that footage that would explain why he had done this? A soft ping shook my memory away, and I looked at the computer screen. I walked closer and noticed there was a notification on the screen. It was a notification to join a chat room. 
curiosity got the best of me, and I clicked on it. A chat screen opened. It wasn't like a usual chat screen. It was a black box, almost like a command prompt box. At the top of the box, there was a section that said users. Under users, there were two people listed in the chat room. I was one of them. My name was Ben. The username of the other guy was obviously a fake one. It read Anonymous 53. Whoever this was, he definitely didn't want to make himself known. I typed in the chat. Hello? Who is this? Who I am isn't important. What matters is who you are and what you have done, the man responded. I knew he was trying to frighten me. I didn't have anything to hide. Is this about Marcus? I asked. I knew it had to be, but I wanted to confirm. It's about crimes and punishments, the guy said. What do you mean by crimes and punishments? I asked. You killed Marcus. That is first degree murder. And the punishment is life in prison or death, he typed back. You are insane. I didn't kill him. He killed himself. I typed back in a fury. He replied, you indeed killed Marcus. How can you make such an accusation? What proof would you even have? I typed back. He attached an image. It was a text conversation between Marcus and I. The blood from my face drained. It was a conversation I regretted ever having. It read, Hey Ben, do you think I could join you at the party this Saturday night? I replied, No man, I don't think that would be a good idea. And why would that be? Marcus asked. Well, you just sit in your room all day and play video games. And you are a bit awkward around the ladies, Marcus. If anything weird happens, I will be the one to blame for inviting you, I said back. Man, that is harsh, Ben. You really think that of me? We have been friends all these years. We used to play Halo together. Remember that, Ben? We used to grind late at night on new accounts to get them to level 50, and then we would sell them, he replied. Yes, Marcus, of course I remember those days. But I grew out of the video game phase, and you're still deep in it. You're still my good friend, Marcus. You just have to understand that I have a life now, and you are still socially awkward, I said in the conversation. What do you mean socially awkward, Ben? Marcus asked. Come on, Marcus. I really don't want to go through this with you. No, lay it straight on me, Ben. Tell me how you really feel, he said. Last time I invited you out, one of the guys told the hottest girl there to talk to you. All she did was say, hey, and you just stood there frozen. No words came out of your mouth. Everyone just started laughing and you bolted from the party. I mean, you're my good friend and all, but that situation ruined my reputation and credibility. It took forever to get it back and I just don't want to have any future incidents. I said, that hits hard, man. I see how it is. You picked the cool crowd over me. Have fun being a fake douche and trying to fit in with them. That was the last thing Marcus said to me. I was speechless. How did this random guy have access to my text messages? The screen transitioned back to my conversation with Anonymous 53. I typed back, how the hell do you even access my messages? My team and I have our ways, he replied. What do you mean you guys have your ways? I asked. We control the dark part of the internet, the side of the internet that no one really knows about. When you see a picture of an iceberg, only 10% of it is actually above the surface and the other 90% is below the water. The internet is only 10% of what you see. We observe and control the other 90%. The access we have to information would make your head spin. We do our best to fix things that are wrong in society. Think of us as your modern day Robin Hood, he said. What do you want from me? I asked. I want the same thing that happened to Marcus to happen to you. My stomach dropped to the floor. My hands started to shake. Why, why would you want that? I asked. Well, you killed Marcus, he typed. I did not kill Marcus, he killed himself. Yes, I do regret having that conversation with him. I am really sorry I was a jerk to him, but I did not help him on the chair and I never tied a string around his neck. I certainly didn't help him jump off the chair to his death. He didn't reply right away like he usually did. Now I was getting angry. My hands were shaking in rage. I knew I needed to stop talking to this jerk and call the police immediately to report Marcus's body. Something in me just couldn't stop talking to this guy. He finally responded. Ben, you indeed killed Marcus. Your actions sent him over the edge. You are the one to blame. Screw you, I did not kill Marcus. You are just a lowly hacker. You do not intimidate me. I am not a lowly hacker, Ben. I am anonymous. We do not forgive and we do not forget. You will do as I say or your life will be much harder, he replied. 
Then what do you want me to do? I asked. I already told you. You need to kill yourself, just as Marcus did, he replied. You're a joke. I am not doing that, I typed back. I figured you'd say that. Why don't you go ahead and take a look at the video footage? I think that will change your mind. All of a sudden, a video loaded on the screen. It was Marcus from earlier that day. He didn't look well. He stared aimlessly at the wall with a blank expression across his face. He started to pace back and forth across the room. All of a sudden, he went out of the screen into another room and returned with a chair. He placed the chair underneath the fan. He left the screen for a few seconds and returned with some rope. He began tying the rope around the fan into a loop. My jaw dropped to the floor. I suddenly came into the video. I was wearing the same clothes I have on right now. Everything looked so real. How is this possible, I thought to myself. As Marcus stood up on the chair, I was right behind him. My hands were positioned behind Marcus to make it look like I was helping him onto the chair. As Marcus leaned into the noose, my hand guided him from behind. My stomach dropped. Anonymous 5-3 had deep faked me into the video to make it look like I helped Marcus commit suicide. I felt like passing out. This was all too much for me to handle. A real voice sounded from my computer. What are you going to do, Ben? You better act quick. The cops are already on their way. We already sent them the video. In the distance, I started to hear sirens. The sirens got louder and louder. I looked outside my window. To my horror, police cars lined the street. I knew what I had to do. There was no getting out of this. I stepped over Marcus's body and got on the chair. I took one deep breath and jumped into the rope. Everything went black. My name is Jared. I once had a normal life like most people. I had a stable nine to five job and a steady girlfriend. There was enough food on the table each month and some left over to put into savings. Most people would say I was well off and fortunate to not be struggling. That is not how I felt on the inside. The consistent grind at the office was wearing me down. Putting a fake smile on my face every day and doing tasks I hated slowly ate away at me. I knew I wanted more in life and this corporate slavery wasn't it. Once I figured out this was all a simulation, I quit my job. What's the point of wasting away at a job if nothing is real to begin with? I know what you're thinking. I'm crazy or I'm a lunatic. That is what everyone else told me. I could care less about what people think now. I know what happened to me and what I witnessed. Here is my story. You can believe me or not. One day after work, I went into my office. I closed the door and locked it behind me. I didn't want my girlfriend Kelsey to know what I was doing. It wasn't anything nefarious, but I wasn't proud of it either. I had been talking to this guy on the dark web. His name was Alex. I met him on a site similar to Reddit, but a dark web version. I can't give away the link due to the secret nature of it. I met Alex on a conspiracy thread. We became close and eventually started to message each other on a daily basis. We would share our takes on current events and news. On this particular day, Alex would share some knowledge that would change my whole life's trajectory. He logged into the chat. Hey Jared, you are not going to believe this. I found a rift in reality. This world we live in, it's not actually real. Get a grip, Alex. You were talking crazy. I know we discuss conspiracy theories from time to time, but this is just absurd. Alex continued. No, I really discovered something big. You need to listen to me. This better be good, Alex, I replied. Okay, hear me out, Jared. The universe has billions of stars and likely tens of trillions of planets. Just in our Milky Way galaxy, we know that more than half of all stars may have a habitable planet. These planets are located at just the right distance to have liquid water and possible life. So if our universe is almost 14 billion years old and it has all these planets, where are the aliens, Jared? That is a good point you make, Alex. But maybe they haven't developed the technology yet to travel vast distances. Did you ever think of that? I asked. Yes, but statistically, there is likely a civilization out there billions of years ahead of us. I'm sure they've mastered interstellar travel by now, he replied. Well, besides the alien aspect, what other evidence do you have? I asked. There was a team of researchers who embedded computer code into physical strands of DNA. They were able to control the DNA with this code. This proves undoubtedly that biological reality is in fact just computer codes, he replied. Okay, that's very interesting, but there's nothing really substantial about the points you make, I typed back. 
Alex responded. Well, I'm getting to the good part. I did a deep dive on the dark web, researching the topic of simulation theory. I came across a guy who had briefly escaped out of the simulation we're in right now. He saw the real world, or base reality as Elon Musk calls it. How would you even trust what this guy says? Half the people on the deep web are full of themselves, I replied. The man gave me instructions on how to access base reality. He messed around with DMT and created a much more potent variation of it. Basically, all you have to do is take enough and you can briefly get out of the simulation. If you don't take enough, you will just have a normal DMT trip, Alex replied. So wait, you actually took this stuff? I asked. Yes, Jared, I took it. And what I saw was exciting, yet disturbing. For a brief second, I was able to see base reality. Upon opening my eyes, I was in a tube filled with liquid. A breathing apparatus was keeping me alive. Around me, there was a farm of other humans, all in the same tubes, unaware of their existence in this realm. Every human around me had a helmet on their head. This helmet had wires protruding from it. I concluded, this must be how they keep us in this artificial world. Electrical signals must block our sense of the real world. The scene was similar to that of the matrix. Before I knew it, the drug wore off and the signals from the helmet took over my brain again. And I went back into the simulation we are in now. Wow. That is quite the experience. Are you sure it wasn't just a hallucination? A lot of people that use DMT report crazy, lifelike experiences, I said. This was no hallucination. There is no way to prove my experience. You just have to feel it. It was the most alive I have ever felt, even being stuck inside of a tube. It is amazing how limited we are in this realm. It is all just fake and we don't even know it, he replied. Besides the other humans and tubes, what else did you see? Were there any people walking around managing the operation? I asked. Alex typed back. Yes, that was the freaky part. When I looked around, I saw these weird gray beings. They were short, had no mouth or ears. They had these big eyes, kind of like the aliens you see in the movies. They didn't seem evil, but they didn't seem good at the same time. I don't really know what their plan is for us. Maybe we are just their slave in the simulation. Kind of like how some computer hardware is used to mine Bitcoin. That is a very interesting take on it. Do you have any of that DMT variation left? I asked. I thought you'd never ask. I have enough for six more doses. I will ship you three of them. Maybe we can do it at the same time. I've heard some stories of people having group experiences on this. Maybe we will wake up next to each other in the tubes, Alex replied. I was still skeptical of all this. I doubted much of Alex's story but I was willing to put his theory to the test. Okay, Alex, ship me three of them and we can try it together and document our experiences. Sounds good. You should receive the package in about three days time, Alex replied. Three days went by in the blink of an eye. I was home alone. It was my one day off and my girlfriend Kelsey was away at work. Suddenly, I heard a knock on the door. I went to answer it. There was nobody at my door. I glanced down at my welcome mat I noticed a small bag. This had to be the drug Alex was talking about. I opened the bag on my table and noticed three smaller bags that contained orange powder. This must have been the three doses. If I was ever going to do this drug, today was the day while Kelsey was at work. She would kill me if she knew what I was up to. I pulled out my phone to call Alex. He promptly answered. Hey Alex, I finally got the stuff, I said. That is good news. You wanna try it today? Alex asked. I thought about it for a second. Should I even do this? What if I am not the same after? I thought about my average existence and decided I had nothing to lose. Yeah, let's try it, I responded. Okay, make sure you only take one packet. Pour the powder into a pipe and wait for me. Our trip should last only a few minutes, Alex replied. What happens if I try to take two packets at the same time, I asked. I would assume it lengthens the experience, but I wouldn't do it. You should ease into it first. Maybe the second time we try it, we can do two packets instead of one, he said. I got my pipe ready and poured two packets in. I wanted to have a strong and meaningful experience. I knew Alex said not to, but I did it anyways. All right, Jared, are you ready to light your pipe? Yes, I am ready, I said. Make sure you take three deep inhales. Don't stop until you take three. Sounds good, Alex. Okay, on three, one, two, three. I lit my pipe and inhaled. 
At my first inhale, I started to feel dizzy. I tried to keep it together. I took another breath. This time, I started to lose consciousness. I knew I needed to take one last deep inhale. With all my willpower, I took one last hit. I lost all bodily function and slumped over in my chair. My mind went black. All of a sudden, I was awake again. It felt like I was in a pool of gelatin. I was in the same tube that Alex described. I felt alive, like I had woken up from a bad dream and this was reality. I looked around. To my shock, there were rows of other humans stuck in the same tubes as I was. Everyone was wearing black spandex pants. All had helmets on and breathing apparatuses attached to their mouths just like me. All asleep and unaware of their existence. I turned completely around and to my shock, Alex was in a tube behind me. His eyes were open and he waved at me. I waved back. I pointed towards the top of the tube and he nodded in return. I pulled myself to the top of the tube and pulled off the helmet attached to my head and the breathing apparatus. Alex did the same. When Alex got to the top of his tube, he passed out and fell back into the liquid. His fall made a splashing sound and must have alerted the creatures working the facility. All of a sudden, three alien creatures were surrounding his tube and putting back on his helmet and breathing tube. I climbed out and collapsed onto the floor. My legs were weak and I could barely get up. I limped away. I finally got to my feet and started walking. I saw a large black screen in front of me. Behind me, I heard footsteps. They knew I was free. As I continued my trek to the screen, the footsteps got louder and louder. Finally, I got right next to the screen. The text on screen read, Operation Sleeping Humans. Underneath it, there was the word goal. Next to the word goal, it read, Place humans in a simulated reality. They are too dangerous to be let out into the real world. Right when I finished reading, a hand grabbed my shoulder. I turned around and faced a gray alien. He had a syringe with green liquid and injected me in my neck. I woke up back in my house. The door opened. It was Kelsey. Honey, I'm home. How was your day off from work? Hey everyone, be sure to sign up for the 30-day free trial with Shudder.com to get access to new bone-chilling horror movies and TV shows for 30 days completely free. Just use promo code NOSLEEP at checkout after you create your free account. This offer will not be available much longer, so be sure to sign up today. The link and promo code are in the video description. Now back to the story. You want to join the frat house? Then you need to pass the hazing. I thought that maybe I was going to have to drink a whole gallon of milk or go streak naked across the girls' dormitory. But instead, the college jocks of Sigma Beta Phi had a different idea for my initiation ceremony. There's a database on campus of all the bad shit they've caught us doing. Your job is to hack into it and delete it. Give us a clean slate. Maxwell, the frat house leader, told me. I regretted bragging about my computer prowess now because I knew that the college likely had better firewall security than any of the other intranets I had managed to bypass in the past. Still, I wanted this. So I agreed and got to work immediately. I had only 24 hours to finish the task. So of course I stayed up late trying to figure out the different encryptions. By 3.30 a.m., I was running on fumes, hardly thinking straight. And then somehow, I cracked the encryption. I was in. The firewall was down, and I could see every single file the school had on all of their students. Initially, I was so excited, I almost texted Maxwell the good news. Then I had second thoughts. He had practically threatened me to find and purge this information. So what did they have on him? Could I blackmail him to give me a better position in their social hierarchy? I typed in his full name under the search bar and found a slew of security footage for him, each with a timestamp and date. This was definitely the jackpot. I opened up the most recent file and watched eagerly, hoping it would be exactly what I needed to settle the score. Instead, I saw a group of figures on the college grounds, all dressed in blood red cloaks, circling what looked like a naked girl in the middle of a field. I suddenly realized that they were chanting. Then they started to cut their wrists to draw blood and paint some kind of symbol on the ground. Maxwell threw his hood back and told the others, our sacrifice begins tonight. Join me in prayer, brethren, he ordered. They all started to stab the comatose girl over and over again. I logged out immediately and felt a sick and awful lump in the bottom of my throat. This wasn't a frat house. It was a cult. Frantically, I tried to think of what to do. 
My only option would be to distribute these videos across the web. I know how to access the most remote corners of the internet, where stuff like this can spread like wildfire. So I logged back on and contacted a seller on the dark web black market. Cult videos are hot right now, so this should definitely bring a pretty penny, he said. I don't care about the money. I just want to make sure they can't hurt me. Call it leverage, I told the seller. He insisted on wiring payment to me anyway, and I'll be honest, I was so sleep deprived I agreed to anything just to end the conversation. Afterward, I crashed until the next morning. When I did wake up, I checked the database again and found that all of it had been wiped clean. I initially thought it must have just been my brain fog conjuring up the whole thing. Then I saw two emails, one from the seller thanking me for the videos and another from the vice principal's office requesting my presence. I swallowed another big lump and hurried over there immediately. Is everything all right? I asked meekly as I entered the office. They didn't say a word. Instead, they turned their monitor around and showed me the same disgusting ritual I had seen the night before. Except this time, instead of seeing Maxwell's face, I saw my own. I've already contacted the police. Consider packing your things and understand you will be expelled from our institution, she said grimly. I was in a wave of confusion and shock, knowing Maxwell had set me up. I just wasn't sure how until I returned to my dorm room and checked my own email again. Deep fakes are actually more popular now than anything. My name is Brett Lears, and this is my story. I saw the abandoned factory in the distance. This better be the f place, I muttered under my breath. As I got closer to the factory, a pit grew in my stomach. The place looked like it was straight from the 1920s. The outside was all rusted and in ruins. I slowly opened the door. The inside was more horrifying than the outside. Everything was disheveled and rusty. The smell of the place matched its appearance perfectly. Right in the middle of the room was a table. On the table was a desktop computer. This didn't surprise me. I sat down at the computer. I typed in the same website URL as before, treasurehunt.onion, and pressed enter. The website loaded and the usual five icons loaded. On each icon, it had the word challenge written on it. Each challenge icon was numbered one through five. This was the last challenge of the treasure hunt until I received my award. All I have to do is beat challenge number five. I thought to myself, this better be worth all the damn effort I put in. I clicked on challenge five. A new black box filled the entire screen. Three math problems populated the area. Five plus five, three times five, 20 divided by four. This had to be a joke, I thought to myself. The last four challenges involved complex code breaking, and now the final challenge is just basic arithmetic. I typed the answers next to the questions. Five plus five is 10. Three times five is 15. 20 divided by four is five. I made sure I typed the answers in correctly. I pressed the enter button. Some time passed and nothing happened. I thought maybe the computer froze. All of a sudden, a text box displayed across the screen. Congratulations, it said. A new screen loaded. The layout was similar to any online chat room. There were three names under the user list, including my own. My eyes lit up as I recognized the other two. They were my cybersecurity coworkers, John Smith and Dan Barney. This had to be a mistake, I thought to myself. I was the first to type in the chat. Are you guys really in the chat? I was going to ask the same about you guys, Dan replied. How can I really trust it's you two? John asked. Well, what's something that only the three of us know? I asked. John quickly replied. We worked on that cybersecurity project together for the Atlas firm. We all had unique code names because the work we did was top secret. Dan typed back, yes, the Atlas firm. What fond memories. That is also a great idea, John. Let's all type our code names in the chat. There's no way to fake that. I was the first to type mine, BL594 exclamation point, followed by Dan, DB5763 pound. Lastly, John typed his code name in, JS008 star. Wow, I thought to myself, this really was them. I continued to type in the chat. So how did you guys find out about this game? John replied, I received a coded email from a guy named Morpheus. Dan responded, the same exact thing happened to me. I typed, that is how I got introduced as well. So I assume the prize will be split by the three of us? John asked, I hope so. I replied. I was a little annoyed at this point. All of this hard work to share the prize money with two other people. Were your challenge five questions easy too? 
Dan and John both replied with yes. The chat was silent for a second, and then John continued to type. Something about this game is giving me an uneasy feeling. Why would someone putting on a treasure hunt include us three? I'm beginning to think this was about the Atlas Project. We had to sign our lives away and swear on our souls not to speak of anything we worked on. Maybe we are here together for a reason. Everything John said hit me like a ton of bricks. This had to be about the Atlas Project. Maybe this wasn't a benign treasure hunt at all. Someone had targeted us, but why? Where are you guys located? I asked. Dan replied, I'm aboard this abandoned steamship located in Saugatuck, Michigan. John responded, I'm inside an abandoned mall in Orlando. I said, that's weird. The admins must have a thing with abandoned places. I'm in an old abandoned warehouse in the outskirts of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Did you guys see that message on your screen? John asked. Both Dan and I responded with no. John continued, red text came across my screen. It said, you know too much. You must kill yourself. A pill will dispense from the computer. Swallow it and everyone you care about will be spared. You're messing with us, John. Stop playing around. This isn't funny, I said. John responded, I wish this was a joke. I am dead serious. A white and black pill dispensed from the computer. A timer just appeared on my computer. My stomach dropped. Different thoughts raced through my mind. What if this was serious? What would happen to John if he did not comply? I said, just stay calm, John. This is probably a sick joke. I'm beginning to think this whole treasure hunt was a sham. Dan replied, yeah, I wouldn't be too worried, John. I doubt anything will happen once that timer hits zero. I really hope you guys are right, John said back. How much time do you have left? I asked. Only 10 seconds, he replied. The 10 seconds went by and we didn't hear back from John. Is everything okay, John? Dan asked. Yeah, I guess. Nothing happened. Wait, an image just popped up on my screen. Some time had gone by and John didn't say anything more. So what is the image of? I asked. My daughter, she is dead. They killed her. My wife is next, they said. An overwhelming sense of dread consumed me. This had to all be a lie. There's no way. I typed, how do you know it's real, John? Images can be faked. It is real. There's, there's just too much detail. She's gone. This is my last message. I am swallowing the pill. I will not let my family perish. Damn it, John, wait. You don't know what you're doing. Dan typed back. All of a sudden, a notification came across the screen. John Smith logged off. What the hell is going on, Brett? Dan asked. I don't know. This feels like a Black Mirror episode. I don't know what to make of this. I think we should travel to John's location, I replied. I didn't hear back from Dan for a while. Dan, is everything all right? No, I just got the same message on my screen as John did. It says you know too much. You must kill yourself. A damn black and white pill just dispensed from the computer and a timer is counting down from a minute. What are you going to do? I asked. This is all BS. I'm going to wait and see what happens. What is the timer at now? 10 seconds, Dan replied. I prayed that nothing would happen to Dan's family. Okay, the timer hit zero, Dan said. And what happened? I asked. I didn't receive a response for a while. I started to get nervous. Dan, what is going on? They are cowards. They sent me a picture of my wife's severed finger. Her wedding band was still on it. I'm doing it, Brett. I'm going to swallow the pill. Damn it, Dan, don't do it. It was too late. Dan was another victim. All of a sudden, the same text displayed across my screen. You know too much. You must kill yourself. A pill will dispense from the computer. Swallow it, and everyone you care about will be spared. My stomach fell out of my chest. Reality as I knew it felt like it was caving in. I stood up from my computer and ran out of that old factory as fast as I could. I turned on my smartphone. A message popped up. It said, you can run, Brett, but you can't hide. I immediately threw my phone out of the car. I raced home wondering if I would even have a family to come home to. Upon opening the door, I was greeted by a police officer. He said, have a seat, Mr. Lears. Where the hell is my family? I yelled at him. Don't worry, they are safe. They are in good hands, he said back. What the hell could this be about, I thought to myself. I proceeded to sit down on my couch. The man continued to talk. We found the body of John Smith's daughter and the body of Dan Barney's wife in your house. My face lost all color. I thought I was about to faint. No, that can't be possible. What are you talking about? He leaned closer to me and whispered in my ear. This didn't have to happen, Brett. 
You should have just swallowed the pill. I will give you a second chance. Here is another pill. He held out a black and white pill in his hands. And if I do this, you promise you won't harm my family? I asked. Yes, that is a promise. Sorry you got caught up in this, Brett. There is just no other option. You three just found out too much about the Atlas Project. I swallowed the pill and my world went black. The past, present, and the future are all connected and can be manipulated. I thought it couldn't be true, that it was all just made up. My actions on the dark web permanently changed my reality, and not for the better. It all started one rainy day in college. I had just finished my last class of the day and was excited to get back to my dorm room. Once I arrived back in my dorm, I quickly got on my computer. I was anxious to see what new websites awaited me. I sort of joined a dark web mailing list. People would send me interesting sites that they found, and it was all in good fun. One day, I received a message from an unknown user. It said, change the past, the present, and future. The choice is yours to make. Just click the link below. The link read, butterflyeffect.onion. Thinking I had nothing to lose, I clicked on the link. The webpage loaded, and there was nothing on the screen besides a butterfly icon in the top right-hand corner. I tried clicking around and nothing happened. Then all of a sudden, a few tabs appeared on the left side of the screen. Top down, in order they read the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, all the way to the 2000s. I randomly chose a decade and decided on the 1940s. I clicked on the tab and another blank screen loaded. There was no text or anything. Then all of a sudden, I received a message. At first it seemed like Morse code, but my computer quickly switched the Morse code into actual text. It read, help, 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 the Nazis have occupied Warsaw. They are rampaging through the streets and forcing residents out of their homes. If there is anyone out there, please respond. This had to be some kind of sick joke, I thought to myself. There was no way a guy in the 1940s was communicating with me. I decided to play along and thought it was all in good fun. Yeah, that happened in like the 1940s. The year is 2021 now, I typed back. What are you talking about? Please, for the love of God, send help. Is this the United Kingdom I am speaking to? He asked. No, I am a college kid in America. The year is 2021. Stop playing these games with me, I replied. Stop playing these games? Are you mad? The whole city is being overrun by Nazi soldiers. Please, put someone else on the telegraph that will actually help. Okay, I will help you out. But please, first tell me your full name, I said. He responded, my full name is Paul Friedman. I was shocked. Paul Friedman was my great grandfather. He had survived Germany's occupation in Poland. And after the war, he gave birth to my grandfather, Isaac. This could not be real. Someone is probably just pranking me. He most likely pinged my IP address, found out my name, and did some basic background research on Ancestry.com. This was a clever ruse, but I wasn't buying it for one second. Okay, Paul, what is your wife's name? I asked. Wife? I don't have a wife. I have a girlfriend and her name is Cecilia. Why is that even important right now? He asked. I thought to myself this guy was quick. He must have looked up the year my great-grandparents got married and realized they weren't married just yet. This guy was quite the trickster. I thought about a question I could ask him, something only Paul could really answer. I found the perfect question. There was a nickname that Paul gave Cecilia that only close family members would know. Last question, Paul. What is the main nickname you have for your girlfriend, Cecilia? I asked. Are you insane? Give me some damn assistance. We need the allies to fight back and push the Nazis out of Poland right now, he exclaimed. I responded, answer the question and I will help you immediately. The only nickname I have for her is West End Cecilia because she always listens to the West End Blues by Louis Armstrong, he replied. The color drained away from my face. This had to be my great grandfather, but how could this be? This couldn't be at all possible. He died in the 1970s. I had this gut feeling it was him. I needed to help him. Maybe I could use future knowledge from the result of the wars to help his current situation. My great grandfather, Paul, used to live in Germany before Hitler rose to power. Paul's parents adopted a kid named Hans into the family. Hans and Paul were stepbrothers. Once Hitler gained power and started persecuting Jewish people, my family left Hans with another family in Germany. My family was Jewish and Hans was not. Hans remained faithful to Germany and became one of Hitler's right-hand men. Okay, Paul, 
I am here to help you out. I can't send troops in, but I may be able to give you knowledge that could change the course of the war, I said. Okay, and what nonsense could this be? He asked. You have a stepbrother, Hans. Right now, he is very influential to Hitler's reign, correct? What? How do you know about Hans? Who are you? He replied. Don't worry about that now. Do you have any way of contacting Hans? Can you send him a telegram? I asked. I suppose I could try and send him a coded telegram to his office. You still didn't tell me how you even know of him. You are probably just another Nazi trying to triangulate on my position. I am not fooled by this for even a second, he said. Calm down, Paul. Just relay this message back to Hans. He might be able to change your fortune and the fate of millions of others in Europe right now, I said. This better be good, he said. Believe it or not, the Allies will win the war no matter what. You just have to convince Hans that the persecution of the Jews is wrong and that it is not a winning strategy. Then he has to convince Hitler of this, I said. Okay, well, what should I say? Paul asked. I thought about the family stories I've heard of Hans. Some of my family said that Hans had a soft spot and that he was actually planning to kill Hitler for years, but never had it in him. I thought of a good message for Paul to send. Send this message to Hans on your behalf. The rounding up and persecution of the Jewish people is detestful. You should be ashamed of yourself, Hans. I knew better of you when we were growing up. You will be tried for war crimes and put to death once the US wins. If you want any salvation, tell Hitler he must stop this madness. If he does not stop, you must kill him, I typed back. I knew this was a Hail Mary attempt to change the outcome of Paul's situation. I thought maybe Paul's message to Hans could send him over the edge and he might actually kill Hitler. This is crazy, but I will try it, Paul responded. Months went by and I tried logging onto the same website with no reply from Paul. Eventually, I concluded it was all a big hoax. Someone was playing around with me for their own amusement. This all changed one day. It was a cold and rainy May day. I turned off my dorm room lights and went to sleep. When I woke up, I saw Nazi symbols all over my room. I had a school uniform draped over my office chair, but it had swastikas embroidered on the shoulders. I was horrified. Did my roommate play a sick prank on me? Was I still dreaming? This couldn't be reality. I moved my mouse on my computer. There was a notification from Paul. It read, Hans did it. He killed Hitler. I thought it would end. I thought everything would be peaceful. A crazier man than Hitler has taken charge. They are killing everyone. Germany has occupied America. This will be my last message before my likely demise. Please stay safe wherever you are. From Paul. I felt horrified. I had created a new reality from playing around on the dark web. In this world, Germany won World War II and now occupies every country around the world. My roommate walked in. Hey Jake, I'm on my way to racial purification studies. Are you coming with? Um, I think I'm going to take the day off, Trevor. I need to rest for a bit, I replied. Don't make me report you to the authorities, Jake. You know the rules. I am obligated to report you if you don't come. It is imperative we go to this class every day. We can't ever miss a class, Jake. This is not good, I thought to myself. I put on the dumb uniform and walked to class. Every student was dressed in a Nazi youth uniform. This was horrible. What had I gotten myself into? I wanted to make this bad dream go away. I sat down in the classroom and the teacher began talking. America is bad. America is bad. America is bad. As soon as he got done talking, all the students repeated it back exactly how he said it. I remained silent. Is there a problem over there, Jake? My teacher asked. Yeah, there is. America is the greatest country on earth. It was founded on pre-existing rights and freedom, not this authoritarian hole. The whole class turned around at me and gasped, horrified that I would ever speak such a thing. The teacher lifted his phone and said, code black, code black, we need a student removed immediately. A group of soldiers took me out of the classroom and gave me some kind of medication that made me pass out. When I awoke, I was in a prison in the middle of nowhere. Here is my only advice. Never go on the dark web, and especially don't try and mess with history. All of a sudden, the world displayed across my computer screen. It was Earth, but the view was from space. 
a red box appeared on my screen that surrounded Earth. Text flashed across the screen. It read, Target acquired. My heart fell through the ground. Who was targeting Earth? Could it be another country? Maybe Russia? An alien race, possibly? Who would want to destroy the whole Earth? Cold sweat ran down my neck as I retracted how I even got here. As a cybersecurity analyst, I never considered my job of any importance. My work days were rather mundane. I mostly dealt with small companies and government contracts. My horrifying ordeal all started when I traveled to downtown Chicago for work. My task was to enhance a company's cybersecurity system. I finished up the job and left the building. While walking back to my car, a dark van with tinted windows pulled out. A side door opened and three men dressed in all black yanked me in. A bag was draped over my head and I felt the cold barrel of a gun shoved against my neck. Hours passed by and then the bag was finally removed. I opened my eyes and looked around. I was in a huge empty airline hangar. There were three officers standing in front of me with unmarked uniforms. One of them said, your country needs you. Your skills can save all of us. Me? How could I possibly do that? I replied. One of the officers motioned for me to follow him. He led me to a confined room within the hangar. It contained a massive server tower and a few computers inside. There is a threat out there and we are attempting to locate it. Your skills may prove useful. So what do you say? Do you want to help us? He asked. I knew I probably didn't have a choice in this matter. If I refused, they would likely force me to do their dirty work anyways. I played along and replied, yes, I would love to be of assistance. The officer filled me in on the details. We've recently detected signals across the internet, which seem to be coming from a source other than our planet. At first, we thought maybe these were random signals that couldn't be properly triangulated. However, after a deeper search was made, we discovered that none of them seemed to have any of the same type of coding that we use here. All the messages seemed to be originating from one particular dark website. We aren't entirely sure if these are extraterrestrial messages, but we want to be open to the possibility just in case. You're telling me aliens might be using the dark web to send us signals? I asked. The officer responded, that possibility is still on the table. We will provide all the intel we have gathered thus far. Perhaps you can track down the source from there. The officer gave me a handful of encrypted messages and their source code along with the website's URL. I was fascinated by the complex algorithms used to encrypt these messages. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It took almost all night, but I did manage to break through. Their decrypted messages shocked me. It seemed to be a conversation between three people or beings. The usernames were A12, X53, and Z2. These were most certainly code names. X53 started the conversation by saying, we need to eliminate them. A12 replied, no, we put them on this planet for a reason. Much of their technology has also proven useful for us. They are also in the process of building advanced artificial intelligence systems. They are on track to merge with machines like our civilization did 300 years ago. Once they completely merge with AI, we can reveal ourselves to them and fix their planetary problems. Z2 jumped in. I agree with X53. The human experiment was on a good track, but their evil tendencies will be their downfall, and they could actually harm us with artificial intelligence. A12 replied, Even if an evil country develops a sentient AI, we already put in the proper protocols to stop it. Humans have a unique perspective, and they could be useful in helping us figure out the questions of the universe. I didn't know what to make of the messages. I decided to go to the dark website link where these messages were originally extracted from. The link brought me to a dark screen. All of a sudden, a video feed of our planet popped up. Above the video feed was the same strange code as before, but my algorithm translated it almost instantly. Target acquired, it read above the video. This had to be a bad dream, but it only got worse from there. Within the source code, I found logs of missiles with trajectory calculations for major capitals not just in our country, but all around the world. Then, to my utter shock, a chat box opened. I recognized the username as an earlier one. He was typing in plain English. It was X53. My stomach churned. You've shown exceptional skills for one of your kind, he typed. What do you want with us? I dared to ask. His response made me shudder. Your planet is not suitable for life. Your kind do not deserve it. Therefore, it has been scheduled for destruction in 70 years, he told me. There are billions of people here. They'll all die, I anxiously typed back. Extermination of the human species is the only option, he responded. I felt defeated and frustrated. 
but I felt like I could reason with him, so I asked, then why tell me any of this if it is futile? You are different. We would like to make an offer to you. He sent me longitude and latitude coordinates. They triangulated to a position not far from my house. Think it over. Save yourself or be damned alongside your entire race. I wrote the coordinates on a piece of paper and shoved it in my pocket. I then deleted the conversation I had with X-53. The uniformed officers returned a few hours later. I told them everything, besides my secret conversation. I would like to go home now, I demanded. Six hours later, I was dropped back off in the same black van without so much as a thank you. I knew they would likely try their hardest to defeat the alien menace, but by then, I will already be gone. A word of advice, pray to be abducted too. It may be your only hope. The response of the robot was, I can't breathe. I realized my mistake. The wish had given the robot internal organs. Pass me a knife, I shouted, but Krista was already leaving. This is insane, she said as she slammed the door shut. We had decorated the entire room for the upcoming adoption. Big fluffy brown teddy bears seemed to dance playfully along a bright blue wall. Animal plush toys of all sorts were mounted on top of one another in a corner box. Books bought from secondhand shops perfectly aligned on the shelf, each more colorful than the last. An antique rocking chair placed in the corner to provide just the right amount of sunlight for an occasional story time. And there was the crib. The crib was the centerpiece. My dad had made it for us just a month prior. It was made of shiny mahogany wood with intricate hand-carved details along the sides, the initials of me and my wife, and the date of our nuptials. At the top, he had chiseled a group of horses galloping across the frame. We had agreed if we got a girl, we could paint them pink. Now, coming home with the rejection letter in hand, it was difficult to see anything positive in the room. A judge denied our rights to adopt a child. The teddy bears no longer seemed to be laughing, only mocking us for our failure. The toys all looked worn and in desperate need of a wash. The books were ratty and worn. In the crib, just a hollow bed now that would never be filled. My wife Krista flew into a rage. She grabbed a hold of the rocking chair, pushing it over and tossing the pillows aside. The plush animals were next. She picked up a monkey first and then a penguin, ripping the arms off of both, stuffing flying everywhere, shoving books onto the floor, stomping on the toys. The crib was the only thing that she left untouched. Now it just sat there in a heap of debris, the only remnant of a dream we couldn't achieve. Krista stopped being affectionate toward me, finding excuses as often as she could. And so I turned to the dark web, finding secret sites that I could go and get companionship, using a Tor router to hide my digital footprints. Each time I logged onto the dark web, I felt a wave of guilt wash over me, but it wasn't as seedy or dangerous as I had once thought. Here in these back corners of the internet, people were listening to me. I found a website on the dark web claiming to fix people's lives. Being the sucker I am, I quickly signed up and got started. It was a simple website interface. After creating my account, a screen popped up asking if I needed help. It gave me two options, yes or no. Without hesitation, I clicked yes. I was taken to a chat dialogue with a moderator of the website. His name was Sam. My chosen name was Luke, which was my actual name. Looking back, this was probably a mistake. Sam started the conversation. He said, you've been through a lot, Luke. It's okay to feel exactly what you are feeling. I typed back, I just wish Krista saw it that way. I'm afraid that if I don't give her what she needs, she will eventually leave me. If she does, that's on her, Sam replied. I continued, this whole situation further proves that I'm not ready to be a parent. I can't even fix my damn relationship first, Sam replied. There are a lot of people out there that don't have perfect families and they have kids all the time. You are never fully prepared to be a parent. You learn as you go. Sam, you don't understand. Now with the judge denying our request to adopt and my wife Krista being medically unable to produce a kid, there is no hope for even having a family. Now things are worse than ever between Krista and I. I'm afraid that she is going to leave me. What are my friends and family going to think? You can't let what people think about you change what you want. Sam typed back. I wish I could see things the way you do. How do you do it? I asked. I have a large support system that helps me when times are tough. Their words of wisdom wear off on me, Sam said. I see. That makes a lot of sense, I replied. This website is all about making you happy. You deserve it, Sam typed back. I want to be happy, 
but I know deep down Krista will leave me if we can't have this kid. I know you said I shouldn't get stressed out about it, but we've been together for so long. I want something between us to keep us together, to be the glue of the relationship. I believe having a kid is the only solution, I replied. Sam typed back, when you put it that way, your situation makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, I just wish there was an easy solution, I said. Sam replied, well, maybe there is an easy solution. His reply ignited a spark of hope within me. Don't joke around. It's not like I can grab a baby from a nursery, I said back. I am not joking around, Luke. I can help you out. This is the dark web. You can find anything you need on here, no questions asked. The more Sam talked, the more I felt like this was all a big scam. I started to get a bad feeling about all this. I said back, I'm not going to just buy a kid online, Sam, if that's what you were hinting at. Just listen for a second. There's an old website. I can't remember the name of it right off the tip of my tongue. It was rumored to help people overcome impossible odds. Some people used to call it a genie in a bottle, he typed back. Sam, this sounds too good to be true, I said. Maybe, but if it works, then what's the harm, right? He replied. I guess you do have a point there, but it's an old site, right? How can you be sure that it even still exists? I asked. Give me a second and I will contact a friend that knows more about this. In a few seconds, Sam came back with a response. Ah, I found it. Here is the link. It is monkeyspaw.onion. Well, that's certainly a strange name, I replied. What can I say? I won't lie. It is a strange sight. Check it out. You have nothing to lose and tell me how it goes, Sam replied. The chat screen disappeared. I sat there for a second, trying to decide if I should take a leap of faith. I thought, what the hell? I have nothing to lose anyway. I went to the top of my browser and typed in monkeyspaw.onion. A simple click took me to a dark screen. There was nothing, not even an icon to click on, just darkness. Then all of a sudden, music started to play ever so faintly. The music became louder and louder. It sounded like it came from a hand-cranked old antique record player. Then a swirl of images pushed out the eerie darkness. They were all normal pictures, like people swimming in the ocean, a man playing basketball, and a group of people at church. The only weird thing was that the colors were all distorted. Their faces were all blurred out. In the center of the screen, I saw a blinking red light. The light stopped blinking, and all of a sudden, bright red text filled my screen. Monkey's paw, be careful what you wish for, displayed across the page. This felt bizarre and weird. A simple text box popped up. Tell us what you dream of, it said. A part of me wanted to close the screen and forget about the whole thing, but I looked at the images again. They seemed calmer now, more inviting. Maybe this really could be the answer I was looking for. I typed out my request. I want to start a family with a child, a girl if possible, I said. What would you do if you got your wish, was its reply. I would thank God, I replied. And why would that be, it asked. Because it would be a miracle, I said. Do you believe that miracles can come true? It asked back. I responded with, I wouldn't be here if I didn't, would I? What would you be willing to give to get what you want? Anything and everything was my response. People say that, but do they really mean it? It replied. I do. I just want to be happy, I said. It replied, and having a family would give you the happiness that you seek? Yes, it would, I said. Enter your address below and we will process your request ASAP. I typed out my name and address. To my surprise, there was no payment information requested. I got a thank you confirmation and the screen went white. It was so jarring from the darkness that I had to cover my eyes. It was clear the transaction had completed. I sighed and closed the laptop. I climbed back into bed with Krista, hoping that maybe, just maybe a wish could come true. I fell into a deep slumber. I was jolted from my sleep by commotion coming from the other side of the house. Krista was not in bed. Fear began to come over me when suddenly I heard Krista from the other room. Sam, you might want to come here and check this out. I jumped out of bed and met Krista in the other room. There was a box. It had to be at least two feet in length and height. It had a strange paw print symbol on the side. The color of the paw looked to be the color of blood. What the hell is this? Krista asked. 
I began to pry it open. My heart beat faster and faster as I thought this might be our next child. I was half right. It looked like a child, except it was obviously not human. It also had a shiny metal surface and colorless eyes. It didn't have any hair, a mouth, or any distinguishing characteristics. On the chest of the child was a small computer screen, like a mini iPad. Below the screen was a bright orange button. Krista went ahead and pressed it. A black screen typed out a response. It read, Input parent's name. Is this some kind of sick joke? Krista snarled, immediately repulsed by it. Wait, I can fix this, I insisted. I went to get my laptop and typed into the browser monkeyspaw.onion. I typed in the chat. I have a problem. A reply came. It said, Please state your issue in 50 words or less. I typed, I want my child real on the inside and out. I immediately received a response. It said, Wish granted. Please wait 30 seconds. The robot child remained still in front of me. I squeezed Krista's hand. Her face was still full of fear. All of a sudden, the screen on the robot child began to aggressively type out a single word. Help, help, help. I leaned down to try and talk to it, to find out what was wrong. I typed on the screen, show us where it hurts. The response of the child was, I can't breathe. I realized my mistake. The wish had given the robot internal organs. Pass me a knife, I shouted, but Krista was already leaving. This is insane, she said as she slammed the door shut. I wasn't ready to give up. I reached for a knife and aimed the weapon where its mouth should have been. I pushed down, twisting and grinding into the metal. As it punctured its face, the robot started to scream. Blood dripped down its face where I created a mouth. I grabbed a blanket and wrapped the child up, holding it close to my chest. Slowly, the child calmed down. I said, it's all right, I'm here, you're safe. To my shock and pleasant surprise, it was able to talk. Are you my father? The child asked. Yes, and I will never leave, I replied. Once it calmed down, I laid it down in the crib. My child smiled back at me. Only one thing was missing. I went back to my computer and typed monkeyspaw.onion. I typed in the chat. I need another request. One request is usually never enough, was the reply. I responded, I have a child now, but lost my wife. And you want her back? It replied, no, I want a new one, I said. My name is Oliver Gleason. It was another sleepless night I'd come to know all too well. I'd shut my eyes only to be assaulted by a million thoughts that shoved their way through the darkness, preventing any form of meaningful rest. My mind was plagued with thoughts of my dysfunctional relationship and my likely future unemployment. Regardless of the case, sleep would not come, and I needed a distraction, anything to keep my mind preoccupied until sleep would finally grip me. I started up my computer, opened the Tor browser, and started searching through the endless sea of dot onion sites that usually brought me little more than mild entertainment, or at best, curiosity. During the almost unfathomable amount of hours I'd spend browsing the dark web, nothing of worth had been found, and I doubted my current session would bring anything more than wasted time. But at that point, it didn't matter. I just needed to distract myself. As always, I started my session by browsing drug dealing websites. I wasn't aiming to purchase anything, I just found it amusing to read the ridiculous reviews posted by hopeless junkies and disappointed customers. I was mildly ashamed of myself for finding amusement in their misery, but a glance at other people's misery kept me from thinking about my own. Once the initial amusement had worn out, I left the darker areas to join a chat room I hadn't seen before. Like most places forgotten by time itself, the place held a design that brought back memories from the early 2000s. In a way, I appreciated the nostalgia a flash of simpler times long since gone. In the top left corner, it showed the number of active users, no more than two. Me and a stranger possibly struggling with similar sleep issues. I thought it odd that the two of us should meet so far in the depths of the internet, but ultimately, it didn't matter. I moved my cursor to close the website, but just a second before I could click the little X, a message popped up. Hello, was all it read. Hi. I typed back with mild intrigue. Don't click away from this site, please, the stranger typed. <clears throat> Why not, I asked. All the while, my mouse hovered over the X, ready to abandon my coincidental chat partner. I just need a minute of your time, please. It's a matter of life or death. 
<laughs> I let out a sarcastic chuckle at the absurdity of his statement, but at the same time, I could feel the hairs rise on my arm. My body suddenly felt cold, as if I'd stripped naked and exposed to the harsh environment around me. For unfathomable reasons, my body was starting to panic. I'm just gonna go, I typed nervously. Don't do this, Oliver. I froze in place with my eyes glued to the all too bright computer screen. This stranger had just typed in my actual name. How he'd gotten it was a question that remained to be answered. Whether he had hacked my computer or was an acquaintance playing a prank on me. The first seemed unlikely as I didn't have any personal information attached to my computer. But even then I was using a virtual system. How do you know that name? I asked. If you just stay there and listen to what I have to say, I'll tell you everything. By then, I could feel pearls of sweat form on my back, trickling down and fusing my t-shirt to my skin. I shouldn't have felt that nervous just because of some random troll, but something about the situation just awoke an undeniable feeling of dread within me. I'm here, I said. Your name is Oliver Gleason. You are 24 years old. You were an underachiever at school, but you always falsely considered yourself to be above average intelligence. You thought that if you just put your mind to something, you'd be able to do it. Unfortunately, procrastination got the better of you, and now you're left with little more than a failing relationship you didn't even want in the first place. Your girlfriend, Jennifer, is already looking for a way out. She hooked up with some guy last time she went out. Though she feels guilty, it has made her realize there's just no love between you anymore. The wall of text had appeared in under a minute, filled with personal details and emotions I'd never spoken about to anyone. As undeniably true as it all was, it wasn't about to end there. When you close your eyes, you can't imagine pictures. You've wondered for a long time if that is normal, but haven't dared to ask. It's called aphantasia, since you weren't able to research it successfully. And last, you constantly worry about death, not because of your belief in the afterlife, but because you're worried your impact on this world has been close to nothing. Good news is, that last part might be avoidable. I just sat there, unable to muster up a meaningful response beyond what the f which I couldn't even bring myself to type in. Oliver, I know you're still there. How, how in the f can you know all these things? Who are you? What do you want from me? I asked in a hail of questions. You're not ready yet. I know exactly how this goes. And if I tell you too early, it'll screw everything up. Not ready for what? I kept asking, question after question pouring from my fingertips without thought. I couldn't even begin to theorize as to how he knew that much about me. I'm going to send you something and I need you to tell me exactly what you see. Is that understood? I hesitated, my fingers hovering over the keyboard as my mind raced. Whatever the stranger had to tell me, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to know. During our short conversation, the dread had only grown inside me, accompanied by a feeling of impending doom. Just do it then, I finally responded after what felt like an eternity. No sooner had I accepted, before a picture popped up in the chat box. I clicked to enlarge, revealing an all too familiar cityscape before me. Do you know where that is? The stranger asked. Yes, I used to live there. I didn't even have to think twice. The apocalyptic scene displayed before me had once been the view from my childhood apartment. What do you see? They asked. All I could comprehend before me was the utter destruction. The houses were mostly ruins and the roads had cracked with deep pits leading into dark abysses below. There were no people left, but bits and pieces of cloth littered the streets as if ripped from the inhabitants' bodies. The sky itself was overcast, but despite how familiar everything seemed, there were a few new buildings also taking part in the ruins. Houses I hadn't seen during my last visit a few months earlier. What happened here? I asked as I searched up any breaking news relating to the destruction of an entire city, but there was nothing to be found. No one really knows, but look beyond the destruction. What do you see? The buildings, I know most of them, but there are a few new ones, and a part of the park is missing, I said as an idea started forming in the back of my mind. Do you know why? The stranger asked. Then the idea hit me like a brick, a theory so ludicrous it couldn't possibly be true. Yet I felt it as a fact with absolute certainty. The picture is from the future, I said. That's right. How is that possible? How did you find this? I asked. That doesn't matter, Oliver. What matters is how we stop this from ever happening. But there was a question I needed answered. I'd been taking what the stranger had said as truth, but I didn't even know his name. Who the hell are you? The stranger paused, something that took in stark contrast to his usual behavior. 
A long bout of silence followed, allowing millions of thoughts to speed through my panicked mind. My name is Oliver Gleason. For whatever reason, his bizarre statement didn't strike a single moment of doubt within me. In a way, it made perfect sense considering he knew everything about me. If I had truly contacted myself from the future, why all the mystery? Why didn't you lead with that statement? I asked. Would you have believed it without the rest of this conversation? He asked back. I suppose not. So what's going to happen to us? How can we stop it? There's going to be an event in the first half of 2021 known as the fracture, he started. No one really knows where or how it started, just that it tore a hole in the fabric of time itself. Billions of people are going to die instantly and the rest will be trapped in small pockets surrounded by utter destruction. There they will wait until the fracture spreads and kills them. That is if they don't starve to death first. We've been here for two years now, trying to contact people in the past through the rift. But only now did I manage to find a working link, which just happened to be the website we're currently chatting through. I wanted to respond, but what could I possibly say? You need to warn people, make sure this future never happens. How? You just need... The sentence just ended abruptly there, as if he'd fallen onto his keyboard and accidentally hit send. I tried to regain contact, but no matter how many messages I sent, none reached him. I knew then and there that he'd, that I had died. I've been left with this terrible knowledge of knowing the world is going to end without information on how to stop it. I'm sorry. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video.